Hi, I'm Owen from Bite Size Irish Gaelic and I'm in a school classroom right now and welcome to episode 9 of the Bite Size Irish Gaelic podcast. Even if you're alone learning to speak Irish outside of Ireland, don't despair. Rest assured that there are thousands like you across the globe all interested in tapping into Ireland's native culture. And for all about this podcast, just go to bitesizeirishgaelic.com forward slash podcast. And I've one listener email to read out. Laurie, she emailed today, Laurie Holmes. And I was lucky enough to meet Laurie a year ago when they were passing through Loch Derg in Ireland. And uh, she managed to load this Bite Size Irish Gaelic podcast onto her iPad Nano. And she said, once again, you amaze me with your humor and excellent interviewing. So I was wondering, was Laurie maybe emailing the wrong Owen? I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, uh, today I'm joined by a very special guest on Dr. Matt Wallen. So, Falte Stock Matt, <laughs> tell me who are you and what do you do? Well, my name is Matt Wallen. I am originally from Denver, Colorado. Mm. I grew up there um, until I was 18 and then I moved to Minnesota and I uh, went to college in Minnesota at St. Olaf College and then Oxford College and I trained to be a, an elementary school teacher and a major in fine arts and started out teaching in a middle school Mm -hmm. eventually in middle school in Egan, Minnesota Hmm. and I was there for four years Oh, what? Is that a city or...? Egan is a suburb of St. Paul, Minneapolis Mm -hmm. Okay St. Paul, I suppose, yeah So I was there teaching sixth grade English for Mm -hmm. four years (laughs) and got the opportunity to move to Ireland and came to Ireland in 2002 June okay. 2002, and started out at the University of Limerick, and I did a master's degree in English language teaching, kind of hmm. TEFL, or I suppose in the US they call it ESL, English as a Second Language. Okay, and was it that you were in the States and you said, I need to change something? We have to backtrack a bit because it's not everybody who's <laughs> teaching in an elementary school in the States and ends up, you're the principal uh, teacher or the principal headmaster of a Limerick school project. It's a primary school as we call it. That's right. In Limerick. So (laughs) let's back up a bit. (laughs) How come we got that far? Okay. Well, I only came up because my partner got a job offer. And I didn't know a lot about Ireland, but we came temporarily. And I've Mm -hmm. heard this before. People move to Ireland thinking they're going to get out of here pretty fast. I've heard the same thing about Quark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't always happen. So, uh, I don't know, we were thinking it was going to be a temporary thing, but at the same time, it just lasted. And so I came only to do a master's degree first and then see what would happen. And we weren't sure how long we'd stay. And now it's 11 <laughs> years later, I guess. Yeah, more than 11 years now. And I came to UL, University of Limerick, and I did that master's degree. And I was a elementary school teacher and I thought right. well, if I'm going to stay here in Ireland for a while I'd like to become a teacher here. I have to go back a little bit actually Dude. because um, before I moved to Ireland I was in a dance company and one of the members of the dance company had lived in Ireland and mm-hmm. so she said oh well you'll never be a primary school teacher you have to learn Irish first. Yeah so let's give the listeners a bit of background that even if you're in an English language school mm-hmm. in Ireland and you're in a primary school, so an elementary school, you must teach Irish because you're teaching every subject to the kids, right? Yeah, that's right. Because every mainstream teacher who has a class of their own is expected to teach Irish. And as part of the, the main part of the curriculum, it's one of the big three subjects. So there's English, there's Irish, and there's maths. Or math. <laughs> And so uh, it's one of the big subjects you're expected to spend 40 minutes a day teaching Irish. Wow. So we'll switch back to English. Ach, fanno med math mer. Ta gwell ge gott. Ta gwell ge gott. Well, ta gwell ge gott. Ah, ta gwell ge gott ge kinta. Ta gwell ge gott. Ane ni liskum kade korda mara. Like, er hosi tu eg faulum sen olskol, no a huik tu an yakke tu gedi an gwell tacht. No, konas er hosi tu. Er dus a... Cwyd me gyd i rhaid yn dda egen ysgol. A sydran hwnna, dda i ddyn y ffasta i ni redd dod i o'n ysgol. Dyn i 
on Archer Conchat Urwan Gashat in August eight or so. Neil Moore on Ni Fader Moore on the end of it Urwan Shat and Fader. Ni Revje well Ni Revme I follow. Is cut nap it too? Quick make it seem like come kid. Oh the horn and in the screen, yeah. August V Shay or Alice are fault. August uh when we a long plan of us, August uh hug hook she shin a long thing for neem dog. As Kavid Ama um Hossi to a bin trace blin or go, nor in it nor quit to Kid or your quick may uh Don may on their flag shot in the one she August um on Shin Kui Mayor Rash got Sara in the year Shin. August Commander Shin Hasig May a Bula Ladini Ella Top Way Skull um a score of over. Oh well August um the Anna on Air Munzer on Skull Shin August Honig She Urwine got shot in the TR Skull thing. August the more a day of Cora the Kayla Shinamate. And you have the annual ever show up size core on the cable. August uh commandation via on air air the a thought in a coney in a goni uh supply top in yanif August uh wool may low gminic kuna flex bag a a cur conky. Okay, so I'll switch back and we'll weave some of that back in. So it's obvious to the person listening that you just happened to move to Ireland. Yeah, I, I, my <laughs> story was right? I remember when that person said to me, you, you have to learn Irish before you can yeah. be a teacher. And I said back to him, you mean, get that accent. Oh, okay. Which I'm sure maybe sort of happened too. But anyway, to get that accent, and I said, well, I can do that. But she said, no, Matt, go home and look. Look it up on the internet. And I looked up. <laughs> I didn't know anything about playing at the time. And Wow. <laughs> did, so, did you have another language at that time? I studied French in high school, but okay. I couldn't speak French at all anymore. Okay. You know, I mean, it would come back. Okay. You know, when you get only so far in a language we don't use it in a natural way. So, right. Yeah. So uh, I'll just skim what you told me, Oscar, that oh, yeah. um, you went to a course up in Donegal, in the school. So first you did some beginners lessons at the university here. Right. And that was only like once a week. So there's only so much you can learn. And you went for one week up to Donegal at first. And it really helps your your self confidence. Mm. There's a school there at up in Donegal, am I right? No. Mm. Uh, there, so you told me there's a school, but where is that school? No, just when no. I was working here, I got a job ah, in this school before when you were here. I there. Yeah. I get you. Okay. And then you told me that you basically got to know a couple of people in the Gaeltacht, and you were able to meet them. Were they people you just kind of met maybe through the internet or through friends or friends like? That I okay. Knew. Yeah, and one of them he's not Irish. Okay. Uh, he's from Germany originally, and he speaks beautiful Irish and like poetry, and he's much better than I. Wow. Well, not, mm. not totally Leafa, as they say, but um, uh, or Leafa, but uh, you know, I I found that he was very good at kind of getting the conversation to a level where we could participate equally. I got to know someone from the university in Galway, and mm. she was teaching in the Irish department, kind of an Irish language tutor, and she and I would meet occasionally as well. And then see across the road, there's the square school, just across the road from yeah. the high school here. Yeah. And with a teacher from there. Now I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. about that school. And then really yeah. it was I kept doing that that whole school books thing. I went through all of them, and then once I finished 
I would do about, the publishers put out about four school books per class here, so I do all of the four for second class. So it was just like self-study. It was a lot of self-study. But supported by yeah. getting to meet people. And then trying to make the conversation. What I mm. would change looking mm -hmm. back yeah, yeah. is that I wish I had gotten to the stage of meeting people and making the conversation earlier. Mm. I waited too long, so my written Irish is much better than my spoken Irish. Oh, interesting, yeah. Because I spent a lot of time learning it myself. So I could say that I recognize words, especially back then when I was first trying to speak. I could recognize word, but I never have spoken it, I've never sensed how to pronounce it. So it would be better maybe to try to get faster to that chance to make conversation. Interesting. So, like, there's people listening, right? And we can assume that most of our audience, if we look at the stats, mm. uh, they're not in Ireland. Yes. So those people, they may have like Irish associations or societies locally. Mm. And if that's the case, I think that's the first place to go to, to try to meet somebody else who might be able to practice your conversation with you. Otherwise, like we're working on a online tutor uh, okay. service for Bite Size Irish Gaelic. So working with Irish language teachers mm. to help people learn over the internet. Now, but apart from all that, if somebody's just sitting there alone, they don't have people around them who speak Irish. They're so interested in their heritage or for whatever reason. Yeah. Do you have any tips or hope for them that they can meet with either other learners or a teacher even of Irish and practice it? What do you think? I think there are good chances of that. Yeah. I, mean, uh, I, I, I do think that there are some organizations here in Ireland that will list courses mm. all over the world mm. and, and maybe help you link up with somebody who wants to practice their Irish. And that's, that's easy to do. You just, that's the benefit of the internet now is that there mm. are those links that we couldn't have had maybe 15, 20 yeah. years ago. We would have had to maybe only find only come to Ireland or maybe meet in the local societies that might come around and in the language societies that might develop. But when I was in Donegal, I was mm. meeting a lot of people who would have been from Minnesota, for example, where I was living, and before, and other places, a man who had better Irish than English, he was from Italy, and I couldn't understand <laughs> speaking English, but thankfully I couldn't understand him speaking Irish. You know, there are people from all over the world that are taking it interest in it so I think it's easier now than ever before Excellent. to find people and one thing I did use a lot at first was uh, the media the Irish language media mm. such as TG Cow or you know Radio Nuclear mm. all those things are all available online so you can be from anywhere and the advice I give is as soon as you feel confident cover up the subtitles Oh, you do that? Yeah. Wouldn't that take a while to, to get that confident? Not really. No? I think I used to watch Lust and Rune a lot. Yeah. And, oh, you um, poor thing. <laughs> I don't watch it anymore, really. But I think it's a good It's What I liked about Lust and Rune was it was very good natural colloquial Irish. Mm. And you'd get some context. Mm. You know? Or you could watch it the second time if you really like it. Yeah. Without the subtitles. But I did find it. Yeah, once I got to kind of that point, the sooner I could cover up those subtitles, mm. the more I was actually engaging in the language, not just reading. Wow, okay. Yeah. So it, it's good with the subtitles at first. Mm. You can kind of pick out a word or two and link it to the subtitles. Mm. Obviously, you need a lot of practice and a lot of exposure. But yeah. there are other websites. I know that it just got, is involved with a website or a newspaper called Bio. Bio. Bio.ie. Yeah. B-E-O.ie. Yeah. B -E -O .ie. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I found that very useful because they have they have good quality articles. Yeah. And you can hover your mouse over some of the words and it shows you the English. So yeah. You don't have to be running for your dictionary. You can try to figure it out in the context of the story as well. And I found that was a good website as well. So yeah, yeah all cute. Things, there are a lot of things that you can do, but because I moved to Ireland almost immediately once I thought I was going to start to learn Irish, I, I okay. think I found that it, it was helpful. But even in Ireland, I will say to your listeners <laughs> out there, 
you have to create opportunities to practice, especially right. if you're not living in the player town. Right, so give us a bit of context because even yesterday I was asked that whether somebody who comes to Ireland will get exposure to the Irish language. Yeah. So what's your experience? Paint us a picture. <laughs> well, I think you, you have to go to particular places and particular <laughs> settings to ensure that happening, especially if you're not really confident. Now, I, if I go to the Boys Hotel now, they'll persist with me speaking Irish, but at first they wouldn't. So, you know, because mm. obviously it wasn't showing that I didn't have the ability to do that. So to immerse yourself in it, it is possible in the Goya Tot, mm. in certain Goya Tots, mm. but not everywhere. But, Why but, do you say that? <laughs> I'm being very controversial. I, yeah, no. I, I think that some of the Goya they still have that real sense of we're Irish speakers, it's our first language. And for others, for various reasons, you know, the push and pull factors of language mm-hmm. in any way that some young people are being pushed away, it's not popular, or pulled away from factors like okay. they, they, they don't need that language or it's an impediment. I disagree, but mm. you know, it does seem to happen sometimes. So I think some of the Goya Takti are stronger. Now, are you saying that the stronger Goya Takti are more welcoming to learners or the other way around? Well, I think if you're going to go to the Goya Takti, look for a course because you need mm. some constructive exposure to it. Just hoping, unless you're a very good natural language learner, unless you have that personality where you can sit there and just absorb it, it's nice to be in a situation where it's structured. Yeah. So you can go to, there are great classes in all of the Bayotas, you know. Would you recommend, like, let's say somebody's thinking of in 2014, going to Ireland during the summer. Yeah. I mean, what would they do? Would you suggest just Googling for Irish language courses or is it yeah. a bit more structured than that? No, I, I look for Irish language courses and all of them are on different times and all of them have a slightly different personality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so if you want a really academic focus, you might choose one over one that's more casual, more about socializing mm. through the language, more about just making conversation rather than learning to write, for example, they have yeah. different emphasis. And, you know, you may choose that you want to go up to Donegal because you want to, to learn that dialect or mm. down to Kerry or whatever. Mm. I have only gone to Donegal, mm. but I visited the Great Talking, especially near Galway, mm. and spoken in a kind of natural setting with people. But I, I haven't really been down to Kerry much. Yeah, because... And I know where, that's the nearest way to talk to isn't where it? the school is. But. Yeah, from Limerick. And I love going down to Kerry, down to mm. Kirkagwina. A couple of episodes ago, we were talking to Felicity, who spends mm. about, I don't know, half her time out on the Kirkagwina Dingle Peninsula. Yes. Mm. And uh, actually, I've never been down there during midwinter, so it sounded really interesting what she was describing, but um, <laughs> I spent summers down there camping and stuff yeah. all summer. Oh, it's, it's a beautiful yeah. place. I've been there as a tourist. Even when I was there as a tourist, I, I wasn't finding that many opportunities to speak Irish. I think I did speak Irish once down there yeah. in the museum for the Blasted Islands in the oh. mm. And apparently you get a discount for tickets if you oh, ask them. Oh, I love there. that. So, you know, so I did. Oh, that's an excellent tip. So, <laughs> even so if you practice... And they will give you to you Oh. So, so mm. there, you just only have to learn one phrase. So, I at least that was the case when I was there. So. That's very good. That's very good. Yeah. So, bring me back, right? Mm. Let's go back to the States. Okay. Um, okay. Before you, you had ever even thought of coming to Ireland, mm. do you have any bit of Irish blood in you? or? It's a long way back. Mm. Um, my father changed his name from Foley to Wallen, his oh. surname. Okay. Where's the last name? So I should be Matthew Foley, which would make me fit in a lot more. Definitely. You know, that sounds like a very good Irish name, but um, I think you have to trace it so far back that apparently the last relative who left Ireland left in 1829. Mm-hmm. So that's prior to the famine. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even know the reason. And his name was Michael Foley. Okay. So, um, There's a lot of Michael Foley's around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but it's that's not that so far back, know. though, Matt. If you really think about it, like six generations, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know there are a lot of people that are much closer ties to. I didn't <laughs> grow up with this idea, or oh, you're Irish, or anything like that. I mean, I kind of knew that I had a bit of Irish heritage somewhere, 
but you know, I mean, more so I felt like I kind of learned slightly a Norwegian identity mm-hmm. okay. because my grandfather was born in Norway and okay. my mother maybe had us kind of thinking more of a connection to that. Mm. But, you know, I didn't think about the Irish side of me and uh, I mean, it's, it's far enough back that, you know, it didn't make emigration easier, for example, sure. or anything like that. Yeah, and let's say St. Patrick's Day came along, it wasn't any special no, day for you. Yeah, I mean, in, it was a, a day I can remember that um, in Denver they have a fairly big St. Mm-hmm. Patrick's Day parade. Mm-hmm. And my father was a Shriner. I don't know if you know what a Shriner no, is. No, explain that to me. It's kind of, it's, kind of, it's related to the Masons, uh-huh. the Masons. And so he was in a horse patrol mm-hmm. and they would ride um, in the, the parade. Oh. So we always went down there. And you know, I always find the traditions in the US funny around that. So in Denver, <laughs> right. which is nothing, I, I find this very strange when you start to analyze it. They throw, or they used to, I don't know if they do anymore, they used to throw green bagels into the crowd as part of the parade. <laughs> and I'm thinking the bagel is sort of a sort of New York Jewish kind of association. Yeah, that's a new import in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and so um, they dyed them green. <laughs> I don't remember why. So, <laughs> yeah. So, but I, yeah, I remember it, but it was kind of just, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm Irish and we're celebrating the National mm. Day for Ireland today. No. Yeah. So, um, let's say, bring us a bit closer then. You get to Ireland mm. and you're doing your master's, right? I did my master's degree, yeah. And how did you kind of settle into Ireland or just dealing with Irish people on the street or when you're going shopping? or? Well, you know? I think Irish people are pretty easy to deal with yeah. most of the time, you know. I mean, <laughs> I had no trouble really. Uh, I met people through the course I was doing, them, the master's degree I was working on. Through various other things, I think people are easy going, mm. very willing to come and have a conversation, you know like to help someone out who looks lost, so, mm. you know, that kind of thing. I found it pretty easy. I found it hard at first, I'd say, to make close friends. Really? You know, yeah. I think that's something about Irish people is they have a thousand acquaintances and their family is very important. Mm. And so if you're not having those connections, and also the difference I find too is Irish people have very good connections with people they've known for a very long time. Yeah. Whereas as an American, I was quite used to that really moved kind of re-established your life and, mm. and you know it was a bit different people were always making new friends that being said now I have great friends many of who are Irish many of whom are Irish and English and stuff like that <laughs> it was easy to integrate it. and I found particularly the school so after that master's degree I saw an advertisement for a job here in the minimum school project yeah. and applied <laughs> and got the job <laughs> yeah, so excellent. Um, that sort of, the first two years or so, then I got a bit more serious about trying to learn Irish mm. in order to be fully qualified as a teacher. Because mm. w- were you teaching the kids Irish back at the beginning? No, no. no. So at first, um, they recognized my qualifications as a teacher in Ireland mm. with very little trouble, to be honest. Except I couldn't teach in a mainstream classroom because they didn't have Irish. Or if that were to happen, they'd have to make an arrangement for the Irish teacher okay. for that class. Mm. So I ended up teaching children with special needs. Mm-hmm. It wasn't necessarily an area I had a lot of expertise okay. in, but I learned a lot through the process of that. Mm. So I did that off and on. I also taught English as an additional language, or ESL. Mm. And um, I taught dance for a year. The school was very kind to me to help me keep my work permit. I needed a work permit. If I let it expire, I wouldn't get it back. So this mm. was very kind. And one year I taught dance. I kind of yeah. sure I kept a job, which was a nice experience. I really liked that. Yeah. And then eventually I got closer and closer. And more time in the way I thought, and more time meeting mm. these people. And a lot of time with, you know, all the textbooks all the way up through the secondary school textbooks, you know, the mm. leading cert books. Right. So I kept preparing for that. And I decided I was ready to take the, what's called the Sulai Kaliyat. So like, I think so. Okay, is this for teaching? Yeah, okay. Okay. So um, SCG, mm. and it's a big exam. Mm. First, I had to teach, so I started teaching six class Irish, and I taught for a month. 
So how old are those kids? They're like sixth grade in the US. Okay. Um, but uh, for us, we're 11 and 12 year olds. Mm. So the last year in our school, in our primary school, sixth grade. So they had quite a bit of Irish by then. Mm. So I taught them 40 minutes a day Excellent. for a month. And at the end of that month, I had the kicker come, the, the inspector come, <laughs> to watch me teach Irish. And you would not pass if you spoke a word of English during the lesson. Oh, well. This was quite a strict rule, or maybe a phrase or something like this. So, no, it went fine, and I really enjoyed the teaching of that. And, and that was one part of the assessment, another part was to do a project which you shared with him uh, or hmm. her through Irish. And then the big exam day, which was a day and a half of exams. Oh. So it's pretty rigorous. Two papers or two exams. Uh, the first one won literature. You read a lot of literature and then answered questions about it, poetry and short stories. And the other one was more around grammar and translation mm. and writing essays and this kind of thing. And even essays on it. You, you have to teach this lesson and how are you going to do it. So it was somewhat focused on teaching. And was it mainly Irish people taking this exam? It would be mainly Irish yeah. people who take it. Mostly they take it because they do their teacher training in the UK or mm. elsewhere in the world. Mainly Wales and Scotland and England. And they have to come back then and take this test to mm. become qualified. So. All of the people I knew taking the test, there was one person who was from Northern Ireland who wouldn't have grown up with any Irish, but most of the people would have Irish. No, there are there are exceptions. Mm. I'm not the first person mm. that I'm aware of that's done this. I do know someone of a different generation, an American, who did come, and back then the exam was more difficult. So <laughs> you know, I admire her her ability. And then the big thing was the Avalov, the interview, mm-hmm. and. My goal was to get 70 marks out of 100 in each part and then be qualified to teach in the way of school. And I only got 65 marks in my interview. Everything else was fine. Yeah. So maybe one day. I oh. mind the idea of you know, yeah, yeah. no, not to um, threaten your employment. Uh, yeah, your, no, <laughs> but, but no, I, but yeah, I, that would be interesting, yeah. yeah. But you now, since becoming principal, I, I think you, you know, you've probably heard that I, they teach classes now for parents in Irish mm. in school. It's partly that I think it's important that they kind of keep their own language abilities alive or get some exposure to it, as the case may mm. be. But also, it's good for me, and I keep up my own <laughs> skills. So I, I teach Irish a little bit in some of the other classes. Okay. But for the parents, it's been really fun. Mm. So this year, we had two levels. We had absolute beginners. They'd be mainly parents who are immigrants themselves. Yeah. They've never been exposed to language. And um, and where do you start with those people who are oh, starting from phrases, zero? Yeah. Yeah. Simple, useful phrases. Now, of course, the focus is to try to help them eventually support their children in mm. learning Irish so that they feel comfortable maybe helping with the homework and at least being aware of it. So with them, you know, very much in the beginning it was Kalsan Dit, you know, Kalsatatu, you know, Gurf Margot, Slanawai, you know, these kind of things. They, simple conversations. And then slowly we worked on more things like talking about your feelings, you know, so Tadron or, or, you know. Tatir Sir. Yeah, Tatir Sir. Tatir Sir. And this kind of thing, which is exactly how we approach it in schools. And now, there are two parents um, who are very focused, one from France and one from England. Oh. And they've kind of really stuck with it. There are people who come and go to the class otherwise, but the two of them have done very well. This is their second year now. So at the stage we're at now, we're working on online shikata, the past tense. Excellent. And, and they're very focused. And I think what they like is that it's caused them to take a great interest in their children's homework. So they will come in and ask questions from the homework. But it's great experience. Now, the, the more advanced class, many of them have better Irish than I do, which is an interesting thing to be trying to teach someone who has, <laughs> if not better, at least equally as good okay. Irish. But we have a, a bit more fun just having a lot of conversation, a lot of games, a lot of discussions or debates. Or Excellent, yeah. Before we finish up, I did want to ask you a question mm. about uh, dialects in okay. Irish, because 
we get you know a good number of emails from people who are I get the sense a bit scared or they fear learning maybe what they might think the wrong dialect or not being able to pick up a resource because it's in a certain dialect or it's more kind of generalized standardized Irish so whatever the case is what's your opinion or your view or your advice to such a person who just doesn't know that they know that there's three dialects mm. of Irish, but okay, where do we go from there to learn Irish? Well, I, I would say, I think it's good to get a general exposure to all three. I, I purposefully did that myself because for the listening exam part of that mm. test I did, they play all three. Oh. So you have to get a general sense of it, but I sometimes think people overplay the differences a little mm-hmm. bit. Mm-hmm. And so yes, how are you is asked in a number of ways, but we can also think of how it is different in varieties of English. Right. And so it's perfectly fine to learn all three of them, really. Yeah. Variety. Yeah, maybe once after a while you feel you have a preference, then you start going towards that direction. But I wouldn't worry at the beginning. Mm. I just try that. And you know, most people don't speak a pure dialect anymore. Yeah. There's a lot of mixtures, even with an Ireland, I think. Even with an Ireland, yeah, yeah, that's true. The native speakers, they're being influenced by each other, you know, they're meeting more, I think. Exactly. Like, I've said it in podcasts previously that probably, you know, not probably, it is true that back some years, the next village would have a different expression or a yes. different word for something, right? Right. Yeah, so yeah. each village you go, like, Irish just changed and changed and you'd hop over to Scotland and mm. the Irish and Gaelic would kind of just, it was, you know, kind of a grey Yes, gradually changing. Yeah. So the interesting thing I find about Irish is people speak in their dialect, as in they don't switch to kind of a formal Dublin Irish or something. Yeah, and Kaidan. And So if you're listening to Radio on the it's not like a Donegal speaker will like suddenly switch to a Galway dialect. They just stick to their own, right? Yeah, yeah. But they speak no. together and, and it's, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, they just mix it. It's like you could almost compare it to like a Norwegian speaking as Norwegian to a Swedish person who's yeah. speaking Swedish and they've got this commonality that, okay, we can understand each other and we've probably been practicing hearing the same languages Absolutely. between yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah. I mean, unless you, you, you feel particularly passionate about it, I think exposure to all of them at first is probably the best thing, especially as an absolute beginner try to tie yourself on I'm only learning this dialect and to be honest the, the differences aren't as wide as yeah. what I think I thought at first and now I can hear the differences but they don't become a stumbling block yeah excellent okay Matt uh, I think we'll leave it at that um, you're working pretty late today <laughs> and if uh, the listeners who are still listening now I thank them for waiting this long because we're in an echoey school classroom. But hey, it gives a bit of uh, <laughs> bit of flavour, right, <laughs> to the interview. So to leave a comment for this Bite Size Irish Gaelic podcast episode, go to bitesizeirishgaelic.com forward slash podcast and go to episode nine. If you're loving the show, do leave us um, an iTunes review, a written review, five star. And you can send in your own listener questions and any feedback you have for me, Owen, with a direct email to podcast at bitesizeirishgaelic.com. Thanks to Tukumo for their music, which you hear on this episode under our Creative Commons license. And until the next episode, Slán Gafol, bye for now. <laughs>